So, chapter two, or at least the first half of chapter two, the section on Aristotle. Where do we want to begin? Questions? Uh, okay, so what was difficult? What should I clarify? Terminological stuff, conceptual stuff, structural things, watch you. What was difficult about this? Where do we want to begin? The part where he says, Aristotle says, uh, therefore if there's an end for all, that would be, this would be the good achievable by action. And if there is more, and if there is more than one, these will be the good achievable by action. Okay, do you have a page number so I can find exactly where he says this? So we can look no, into not. it. I only have the quote. Okay. I'm so sorry. St uh, start over from the beginning and I'll find it. Therefore, Aristotle says, oh, therefore. Uh-oh. It's not like the very beginning, I believe. If there, if there were such an ultimate end, knowledge of it would be the greatest of usefulness. Is that it? Or are we looking at someone? Oh, furthermore. She was like, say, achievable. Like, achievable. achievable. Yeah. Find what achievable is. Achieves. It's closest I got. Page 14. Thank Page 14. You. Now, I, I will also say this document is not perfectly searchable. Uh, so it's searchable-ish. Page 14. Okay. So uh, let's just go through this, this paragraph in general, and then we'll sort of expand out from there into the argument surrounding it and then jump around a bit. Cool. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay. So... As there are many actions, arts, and sciences, their ends are also many. Okay, stop. What does that mean? What's he saying? By the way, this is, if you're having trouble with a particular section or a particular thing that he's talking about, breaking it apart like this is probably the best way of approaching. Because if you can get one little thing that he's talking about, break that into little pieces and figure that out, then usually he'll be using those same little building blocks for building on other things in the same topic or the same paragraph. So then things will start fitting together a little better. So what does he mean there? So there are, as there are many actions, arts, and sciences, their ends are also many. Anybody? Each thing has its own goal and there is many of them. Yeah. So we do a lot of different things, right? Not only do we do a lot of things, we also make a lot of things, and we also study a lot of things. So actions, doing, arts, making, sciences, studying. Right? Okay, so there's a bunch of things. Because there's a bunch of things that we do make and study, there are a bunch of different ends that we pursue. So if I, to use an example I used Tuesday, if I take a sip of coffee, that has an end. Right? A particular end in mind by doing this, right? I am caffeinating myself and quenching my thirst, for instance. I might also be teaching, but that's a different action, right? That's two separate actions instantiated in the same like physical motion. Right? I am using an example to explain ends, means, reasoning, and I'm also taking a sip of coffee. Those are, again, two different actions because they have two different ends. The same applies to arts, that is a terminological thing. Whenever we see the word art here, when he's referring to Aristotle, the word translated is techne. Yeah. Uh, I brought this up when we were, when we were discussing C.S. Lewis, I think, right? That this same word means art, craft, um, or even technology, uh, or technique, it's the root for technique and technology. Uh, and this is that uh, this is anything that we make. We apply reason to create something. That is art. So if we make something, then the thing that we're making is the end of that action. This is a distinction he makes uh, a little bit later between, I might have been earlier. No, I'm sorry, slightly earlier in the, the previous page, he makes this distinction between product beyond action and action as end. This is basically the distinction between making and doing. When you're making something, when you're doing art or craft, the thing that you're making is the end of your action. When you're doing something, 
talking about the action itself, the action is itself the end you're pursuing. Taking coffee again as an example. The difference between making coffee and drinking coffee. I drink coffee to put it into my mouth. Right? Simple enough, straightforward enough. The end of what I'm doing is the doing itself. That's the action. Making coffee, the reason that I do that is to have the final produced result. Right? And so this is the distinction, the difference between art and action. Worth noting, an important distinction here, an important part of this distinction is that ethics is the study of what? Uh, people. Nope. Actions. Not of artifacts, not of things that we make, right? So if we are to analyze something ethically, what we're going to be analyzing is the action, not the product, if there is one. So the fact that the end of making coffee is the thing produced, fine, but it's the action that we would analyze ethically. This is also where we get the idea of like death of the author. Right, that authorial intent, talking about what we would think of as art, right? art pieces, literature, whatever. That authorial intent is not relevant to the quality of the thing produced. Quality or qualities or whatever. Right. So if I, if for example, um, this coffee that I made, I made from stolen coffee beans. Still could be good coffee. Right? That's irrelevant to the quality or qualities that the coffee possesses. The ethics of the action has to do with the action, not the thing. Another example of this, because this is an ethics class and I can't not talk about Nazis at least once a week, is that we today still use a lot of scientific discoveries that were made by, uh, by Nazi scientists in horribly unethical ways. Right? There, were a lot of, there was a lot of scientific research done under the Third Reich that involved um, grotesque human experimentation, all sorts of things that, that ought not to have been done, but the discoveries made are still useful knowledge. And so there's a distinction, there's a separation between those two things. Ethically, we can, we can examine and look at the action rather than the thing produced. Okay? So actions can be for the production of some thing, these are art or science. Or they can simply be for the sake of doing the action. The action can be its own end. This is the, this is the case with respect to actions or choices. OK, and each thing has its own separate end. The question that he is approaching here, to skip ahead and to sort of summarize a little bit, is to ask whether everything has an end in common, or at least an ultimate end towards which all other ends are directed. And ultimately, he's going to say, kind of, because it can't be simple. So moving on, this remark reminds us, should we need reminding, that the opening sentence of the Nika McCann ethics, if true, OK, stop. What was the opening sentence of the Nika McCann ethics? He said it already earlier on. We haven't talked about it yet. Yeah, starting right here. Every art and every inquiry, and similarly, every action and pursuit is thought to aim at some good. And for this reason, the good has rightly been declared to be that at which all things aim. So this seems to be saying that every action, even though it has its own characteristic end, that it is all also aiming commonly towards one ultimate end, however that works. So what he's doing here in the passage in question is he's ruling out the possibility that it works something like this. We have the ultimate end, whatever that might be. And we have various other actions that are directed in their own way, right? Say. Uh, drinking coffee for the sake of energy, for instance, uh, or what's something else that you've done today? Give me an example. Uh, I went 
to my phone class. Okay. So, why? Because I have to. The, the, no, you don't. Because I want to pass the class with an A. Okay, there you go. So you're going to class for the sake of a grade, right? Okay, fair enough. Okay, so great. We got uh, we've got some action for the sake of some end. For example, coffee for the sake of energy, class for the sake of a grade, whatever whatever else we might want to say, right? What he's ruling out here is the idea that any end that we might have is therefore itself directed towards some one particular uniting end, everything being for the sake of one particular thing. He's ruling that out, right? That isn't how it works. Not exactly. I mean, what do you just do with the energy with grade? Well, I mean, this part is true. Fine. And we can even ask further questions, like, why do you want a good grade? What, what, a, what further end are you aiming towards by pursuing that end? In other words, uh, to use a technical term that he uses here, what is the superordinate end towards which you are, uh, towards which you are aiming? Right. This is another pair of terms he uses, subordinate and superordinate. Right. And this is basically the way that we order ends and means into sort of chains. Right. So we can ask, for what purpose are you pursuing a good grade? We might say uh, a degree, right? Or whatever. Maybe maybe a degree. Maybe it's not a maybe it's not a degree seeking course. Maybe it's you're pursuing a grade for uh, for a prerequisite for another class, or you're pursuing it uh, for uh, for kind of pride of having completed it, maybe, or pursuing a grade simply as an intrinsic end because you have no other purpose and you just like seeing A's appear in your transcript. I don't know. Again, that's possible. I'm not ruling it out. Whatever it might be, you presumably you can at least have some further superordinate end. But we can also say, all right, what by what means did you go to class earlier today, or now, or whatever? How'd you get here? Car. Okay, great. So you drove here, right? Fair enough. You employed some means to achieve this end, and this end was itself a means to achieve that end, and that end is itself a means to achieve that end. And we might say that maybe all of these various things start uniting, right? And this is certainly the case in some ways, right? Yeah, you're pursuing your degree and you need a grade for this class, but what about, um, what about some other class for which you get a grade, for which you are, uh, which you are pursuing for the sake of a degree? Right? And this class, you might walk from that class. So what we might have is this, this, this interconnected web of ends, which might, it seems, all unite to some one ultimate end. We can see why this might look plausible, because it seems like the ends that we pursue just sort of start coming together to bigger, more important things that we're pursuing all these little things for the sake of. So we can see why it might be plausible that at some point we're doing everything we do for the sake of one particular ultimate end. But that would have negative implications. We don't want to go that route. Okay, why? So let's keep going. That if his opening statement is true, it tells us something true of each and every human deed, whether art, science, or choice. But the unity of the remark is that of generality. I would pause here, but let's go on because he's about to explain. That is, some one thing is true of everything we do. Okay. So essentially what he's saying there is no, it doesn't work like this. There's not one thing that we are pursuing. It's rather that there is one thing that is true of any end that we pursue, that characterizes all of the ends that we, well, at least all the ends we correctly pursue. Because he also gives counterexamples to that, ends we might pursue that are bad ends. Right? He brings up robbing banks and starting forest fires, for instance. Right? Ends that we might pursue but are bad to pursue. Right? 
So there is some characteristic which functions as an ultimate end. In other words, one explanation for why we pursue all of the various ends that we pursue by all of the various means by which we pursue them. Okay, with me so far? Pretty good. good. Anywhere, anything I gotta stop and go back over? Making sense? Okay, so the question obviously arises, okay, what is what? What is it? What is this? What is this ultimate end? What is this characteristic that all of these various ends have to have in common? All right, moving on. If every action aims at some end, this does not entail that there is some end at which all actions aim. So again, ruling this out. Always willing to be explicit, Aristotle gives a list. The end of the medical art is health, that of shipbuilding a vessel, that of strategy, victory, that of economics, wealth, and so on. If any game is a recreational activity, this truth does not inform us of the immense variety of kind of, of the immense variety of kinds of games. Okay, the game analogy. What's he getting at there? What's his point? What page is this on? Uh, 14, middle paragraph. What's the point of the game analogy? If any game is a recreational activity, this truth does not inform us of the immense variety of kinds of games. Maybe it's an analogy, first of all. So let me substitute, just substitute terms. If any action has, a, has the ultimate end in view, let's say, this truth does not inform us of the immense variety of ends of actions. In other words, he's just rephrasing that first sentence, right? So what he's saying here is that if we take this category of things, games. They are all recreational activities. They're all for fun, in other words. That's something that they have in common, but it's not sort of an end they all share. It's not certainly not the end they all share. Every game that we play has rules and objectives. One of those objectives is not fun. Right? You're not playing a game poorly if you're not having fun. It just, you might just be missing the point. Right? So if you're, does anyone remember, um, this is a few years ago, this game went wildly viral. Remember getting over it? Anyone see or play this? No? Anyone? Okay, so th if I describe it, it might ring a bell. It's a, it's a game where you're we're playing as a guy in like a barrel and you have a hammer. And the idea is you're trying to use the mouse on your, on, on your computer to swing the hammer such as to fling yourself up this massive mountain type thing. And it's one of those frustration games because there's no saving. Yeah, okay. If you, if, it's, it's fascinating, and it drives people mad because it's incredibly difficult. Maybe if he said the mother, then I think everyone in this room... I mean, fair enough. I, I, can go with, I, I can go with Among Us as an example. It, it's, the reason I chose getting over it rather, though, was because it's a frustration game in particular. right? So it's hard to say that you're having fun with this recreational activity when you are screaming wildly at your screen and, and you know, roaring in frustration, because that is, at least if streamers are, are to be believed, the kind of result from this. When you are you know, in the game trying to climb up this giant mountain and you make, a, you make one little slip and you fall all the way back down to the beginning oh and there's no save points and everything's horrible. About, uh, speed it's, it's, the speed runs of this are really impressive. It's designed to thwart the usual speed running tactics of skipping things. Um, and so you actually have to get the pattern. It's really impressive. Um, anyway, in any case, it, it leads to all sorts of frustration. So you might be tempted to say, well, it's not fun. It's not a recreational activity if you're this horribly frustrated. Fine, it's still a game. 
and it's still along these lines. The same might apply to, say, Among Us, right? If you, if you, get, if you wind up getting frustrated, or if it winds up tearing friendships apart, for instance, then, well, that can happen, and that is missing the point of the game, but not by doing the game wrong, right? There's a difference between I'm not having fun anymore and I'm not playing the game anymore. So all of the various different games, they have some end in view that is recreation or fun. But that does not mean that fun is one objective in the sort of rule set of the gameplay. Taking a more mundane example, right? If you're watching or playing a game of football, the criteria for victory of one team over the other is very clear, and it is determined by points total. It is not determined by fun. But fun is still the point of the game, whether for the players and or the spectators. This is, that, this is that neat little distinction that he wants to make here that he thinks Aristotle is making. It's not that, whatever our ultimate end is, it's not that it's, it's part of this kind of sequence of ends that we have. It is what makes all of this make sense. It's why we do this in general at all. Okay. Continuing a bit. If any action has an end, this truth cannot substitute for the immense variety of ends. So, if there is one ultimate end, the particular ends that we have in any given action are still significant. Those are still the actual ends that we are pursuing. If I ask, hey, why are you driving? You will answer, to get to class. You will not answer, to get my degree. Even though it's true. This informs this, but it's not why you're doing this. You're doing this to get to class. You're in class to get a grade. You're getting a grade to get your degree. And yes, fine, to some extent, you are driving to get a degree, but it's, it's not... The intermediary ends don't just disappear. They are real ends towards which you are striving. Okay. So he says, while we can soar above the arena of human activity and say that whatever a human person does aims at an end, when we descend, so when we look at things in actual granular detail, we seem faced with the prospect of piecemeal analysis of now this end, now that, now the next, and so on infinitum. So we are not looking at an end that everything else is for the sake of. What we're looking at is one common characteristic that all of these various ends either does have or ought to have if done correctly. Okay. That's starting to fit, a, fit better, to fit together better. Okay. All right, where else from here? What else do we want to look at? What other particular difficulties might we make we have had throughout this? Okay, so for Aristotle, can you mention something about Aristotle about the ultimate end? Mm -hmm. Well, he says that a lot. Yeah, I tried to like, piece together what is what is it, what is trying to say. And I said like it's probably like, the overarching like purpose in life that we need to serve. No, mm -hmm. I said it's like I think I said that I think he means that it's our overarching purpose in life as human beings or what we're trying to achieve in a given moment. But like I don't think that what I what I was thinking that what what I was thinking when I was writing that, I don't think that's what Aristotle is trying to like, convey to us or like whatever like, I mean, what I'm saying. So, like, convey to like the reader to say that this is what Aristotle is trying to say. Kind of yeah, because those are kind of two different answers. Yeah. Right. And now this is difficult because, uh, again, like I was saying, like I was saying really before we started, that 
the structure of this chapter is going through possible answers and saying, that's not right. And here's, here's why it's not right. And then moving on to the next possible answer and saying, that's not quite right either. And here's what's off about it. And so eventually, if you want a hint, skipping ahead to the end, we get something like a coherent, cohesive answer to the question, what is ultimate end? Or what is the ultimate human end? Or ultimate end for human action? But in order to do that, we kind of have to look at the possibilities. Like, like the one we were just looking at, right? This idea that there's one thing towards which all other things are sort of subordinated, which can't quite be right. Other possibilities are particular ends that we pursue, that in pursuing them, we are acting in the highest and most distinctively human sort of way. Right? And he gives some possibilities here. And this is, this is one of the things that you, I assume this is kind of what you're trying to do by saying, okay, what exactly does Aristotle mean by this? Well, here's some things that he talks about, right? So he brings up um, uh, abstract contemplation. Right? So that, there's this whole like, section on, well, abstract contemplation is the highest human end. It's the most distinctively human thing that we do. And so maybe that is the thing towards which all other activities are directed. But he says, no, that's not right. Then I remember why he thinks that abstract contemplation can't be our sort of ultimate end, our highest end. Wait, is that, wait, I'm just sure, like, think of what abstract contemplation is. It's like thinking like pieces or something like that. Yeah, so. He doesn't explain this in the chapter. Uh, where Aristotle explains this, I'll, I'll expand on this for, for sort of the sake of our understanding here. Where, where Aristotle under, uh, explains abstract contemplation, he's talking about the sort of highest level of thinking. It, the, the description that he gives is notorious because philosophers are always like, what the, f what does he mean? <laughs> what exactly is he talking about when he says that it is thought thinking thoughts? Okay. No, it's not even that. It's, it is the process of thinking at the most abstract level of the nature of reality and the, uh, the unity of concepts. What purpose does that serve like a normal human being? Like, why do you need to like, think it doesn't. that level? It doesn't. That's precisely the point. Now, hold that thought, hold that thought, that's getting way ahead of ourselves, but remember one, one point that will come up Tuesday, it'll come up next time, the next thing we read, that the highest and most important things we do are pointless. Eh, keep, that, keep that in mind. It's, I'm going to punt on this and say we'll talk about it later because uh, Plato explains this much better than Aristotle. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Aristotle, you, you, you're confusing it sometimes, so... Plato does a better job. Um, now, there are reasons for that, too, which is that the, Aristotle apparently had a bunch of dialogues that were, that were made for public consumption and made for educational purposes. That's not what we have from Aristotle. What we have from Aristotle are, the, uh, are basically lecture notes that his students took and that were compiled later on. Yes, so it's, it's technical, it's complicated, it's stuff from high-level sort of esoteric lectures rather than the, the stuff he meant for public consumption. Uh, all of his dialogues and, and treatises and things that he wrote for public consumption have been lost. Everything but fragments of one. That's it. That's all we got. So, Plato... Fragments. Uh, so you okay? So usually, when uh, when scholars say fragments uh, of an ancient text or that sort of thing, what they're not referring to, we have pieces of the bit of paper, right? That might be legible or might not. What, what, what we mean is from it from various yes. sources. Yes. Other people writing, uh, other people quoting. Aristotle said this, and in a lot of cases, we'll have block quotes, and we'll have uh, we'll have associations between this page being before that page. That sort of, that sort of thing. So you can reconstruct large portions of a text based on what other people have said about it. Right. So that's what we have for a couple of Aristotle's texts, but not most of them. Most of them are gone. At least as far as we know. They might be, there may be copies of them hidden somewhere, which, man, that would be quite the find. Um, there's a movie about this. Uh, 
It was with Sean Connery. I forget what it was called. Something Roses. It was, it was, about, a, uh, it was about basically a, uh, a, a uh, medieval crusader and scholar who happened across the lost text of Aristotle, and it, it, led to some, it led to some adventures and such. Anyway, it was okay as a movie. Um, anyway, point being that, uh, by contrast, Plato's texts, the texts we have from Plato, are not his esoteric works. We don't have what Plato taught to his students, like we have with Aristotle. What we have from Plato are his public works, what he wrote for public consumption. So the dialogues. That was basically his introductory texts. This is what you came to Plato's Academy and you started, you started learning by hearing and seeing these dialogues, usually acted. Then eventually when you, you know, become a student student, you start getting the, this kind of thing, the lecture content, the, the, the carefully constructed esoteric knowledge of which we have no record from Plato. So we have two completely different styles of work from Plato and Aristotle. And we're getting a little bit of a sample of each of them. We're reading one section of Plato on Tuesday and we're, we're reading about a lot of what Aristotle has to say now. Is there like a big difference between Aristotle and Plato? That's a hell of a can of worms. Um, yes. Um, a lot of which is like actually doctrinal, like there are differences in what they think and their actual, actual ideas and teachings and things. Um, but also, from a modern perspective, um, they're a lot more similar than they are different. Um, and given that Aristotle was Plato's student, if you know anything about sort of relationships between academics, you know that the differences that we make huge deals of are usually really minor, but we make a big deal out of them. So I, I have, you know, <clears throat> I have had my own professors and teachers and mentors and things, and we have vicious disagreements about really minute little issues that probably don't matter to any of you, and you wouldn't even know what the hell we were talking about if we were disagreeing about them. Right? That's the kind of differences that there are between Plato and Aristotle. That they are really significant differences, but they're differences about little things. Uh, on the whole, they, they have a lot of overlap and a lot of agreement. Now, to be fair, that's a, that is even, even that is a controversial position. There are a lot of scholars of Plato and of Aristotle who just insist that they have opposite views on basically everything. And I think those people are crazy and have completely lost sight of reality. But like I said, that's a controversial view. So anyway, where was I? Well, okay, no. Well, so we were talking, oh, I could have looked at the board behind me. Right. Abstract contemplation. The reason he doesn't think that this can be the ultimate end is kind of what you said, that who actually does that? Existential people? Like, even the most thoughtful and, and, uh, and high-minded of philosophers only ever do this on very rare occasion, and most people never do at all. How could this possibly be the ultimate end of human action if most people never do it and those who do barely ever do it? It can't, right? It might be, as he, as he points out, the highest and most human thing that we are capable of doing in this life. That it is that part of, that part of human activity which most fully embodies that which is most distinctive of us, that being our reason. But that can't be the ultimate end because, well, first of all, we barely ever do it. And then also, we cannot dedicate our, dedicate our other actions to doing, the, to doing just abstract contemplation because it, is, it can only ever be a sort of periodic activity because it can't be the focus and dedication of our lives. We are necessarily going to be doing other things. And those other things are going to have their own distinctive ends apart from contemplation. So it can't be that. That can't be the, the ultimate end in any sense, really. Um, other possibilities that he brings up, politics, uh, or maybe we can say legislation for it to be really precise.
And the reason he proposes legislation or politics as a candidate for the ultimate human end is because it covers the most stuff. Politics touches everything, or at least it can. And by politics here, he doesn't just mean you know, rulership. He means the organization of society, which is an activity that we do together. Uh, yes, the ultimate goal of humanity is bureaucracy. I mean... Aristotle was quite amenable to that sort of thing. So, now, Plato, by contrast, uh, We'll get to a little bit, a uh, very little bit, but a little bit of uh, his absolute detestation of democracy. Um, Plato couldn't stand the stuff. He thought that politics was something that a few people should do and it shouldn't matter to most people. And it should barely affect anybody. And we call something Plato's Republic. We'll get to that too. Um, now actually, there's, I already have one of, the, one of the lectures, which I will recommend, uh, the introduction to Plato's Republic. <clears throat> that, uh, I go into there, first of all, the sort of divisions of how the books, the various books of the Republic are set up, including book two, which is one of the ones that we're looking at. Um, and there's a reason I d we skip book one, and I just talk about two, and I'm perfectly comfortable doing that. I explain in the video, I'll talk about it Tuesday. Um, but also, another important thing is that Plato's Republic doesn't have anything to do with politics. All of the, all of the political arguments in the Republic are, uh, are really just analogies for, uh, for the structure of the soul or the structure of the self or moral psychology. But that's for Tuesday. Good thing to bring up. Because he did, now, Plato did write political treatises. His longest book, called The Laws, was, was actually about politics. But it's radically different from what you find in the Republic. So if you're interested, it's that one. It's boring. Forewarning. Uh, it's... It is his longest, probably his least interesting dialogue. Like, this is a general agreement sort of thing, not just, I don't like the subject matter. It's, it's not written in a very engaging way as like a lot of his other dialogues are. So, but it gives you a lot of insight into what he thinks about politics, really, rather than just, you know, the analogy he uses in the Republic. Anyway, so, Politics or legislation, because, for Aristotle at least, it is the most widely encompassing thing that we do, because it covers all other human activity. All other human activity is something we do in a political context. It is something we do together. So maybe politics is this ultimate or highest human end. Mm, kind of. It can't really be, though, because even if everything we do, we do in community, we do in in a political context, so to speak. Political here just meaning communal, not like, you know, governmental or whatever. Even if that's the case, bless you, um, even if that's the case, it seems as if politics is for the sake of the various things that we do. The reason we organize society is so that we can have an organized society in which to do the various end, to pursue the various ends that we pursue. So it seems to be subordinated to the various activities we pursue. So it seems really hard to make that out to be the ultimate end ultimately, so to speak. Okay, fine. What about happiness? Or the Greek word eudaimonia. which usually just gets translated as happiness. It means uh, the connotation is something more like flourishing. The very literal and direct translation is good-spiritedness or something like that. Um, the idea of happiness in this context is having lived well. So the idea of, uh, of acting with, uh, with happiness as the ultimate end or eudaimonia, flourishing as the ultimate end, is live in such a way that you, you are ultimately satisfied by having led, having led the life you led. Uh, there, uh, Aristotle said something about, about this in sort of categorizing eudaimonia or happiness, that uh, no man is happy until he is dead. And he doesn't mean by this that death will make you happy. Rather, what this means is that you cannot say for certain whether you have led a good life until you're done with it, until you can look at the whole thing. 
because you could, if things are going poorly now, and you say, I have, I've led a terrible life, I am unhappy, well, you don't know how long that's going to last, and you don't know what you might be able to do to change that. Similarly, the other way around, right? If you've led, led a great life, but then it turns out you peaked in high school, sorry. Right? So, maybe this is closer, right? It seems like happiness is that for the sake of which we do all things that we do, and it's what makes things good characteristic ends. But how exactly is still a bit mysterious. But I will say, this is probably the closest thing that we get to, at least so far, to something being the ultimate end, the ultimate human end, the ultimate uh, for the sake of which for human action. So we're getting close. This is, this is close. There are also, notably, times that he does just refer to eudaimonia as the ultimate end. So if we want just a simple, straightforward answer, it's that. But it's not quite so simple, and we have to figure out how exactly that applies to the ends that we pursue. But if you want a simple one-word answer, it's happiness. So there we go. It's pretty close. He, um, what do you mean? Like, that's, that's what he uh, considers to be the ultimate end, or, like, Yeah, so the ultimate end for any given human, any given human being, is to be happy. I disagree. How so? Because you might not actually disagree, it might be a terminological thing. So how, how so? Because, okay, I'll come back to that. Okay, so why I think you might not quite disagree, you might, by the way, you might disagree because this is one of those tiny little minor points that Plato and Aristotle disagree about that we'll look into Tuesday. Um, what he means by this is not like feeling good about oneself. It's not that. Happiness in this context is having lived a fulfilling, flourishing, and complete human life. And if that's what we mean by human end, it almost seems circular, right? Because what does it mean to be happy? Well, it's to have fulfilled your highest human end. Well, what's your highest human end? To be happy. Uh, do we see how this might start seeming a little bit vacuous and empty? Because he doesn't just mean like feeling happy or feeling good about yourself. He's, it's not an emotional thing. It's not even a, a sort of an established mental state or something like that. It is an evaluation of one's life. So we have to figure out how we, uh, how we judge that based on what criteria we judge that. And that means that we've got to dig a little bit deeper into it and rather than just saying, well, um, to be happy, right? Now, the reason I say that Plato disagrees with this very strongly is that um, for Aristotle, happiness does in large part depend upon actual life circumstances, right? If you can fail to fulfill your, your ultimate good, your highest function, if bad stuff just constantly happens to you, right? If you just get in three car wrecks a month through no fault of your own, that will severely impact your capacity to live a happy life. Like if whenever you get out on the road, someone just rams into you. That, for Aristotle, he will point out that, you know, that, I mean, didn't have cars, but you get the idea, right? Modern analogy. For Aristotle, that would absolutely mean that you are, uh, you have a diminished capacity for happiness, a diminished capacity for living a flourishing life. Plato disagrees with that because Plato thinks, as we'll see on Tuesday, that our capacity for living a good life, our capacity for flourishing is always entirely within our own control. And we'll look at why, we'll look at how, and this is very controversial, and this is one of the biggest disagreements between the two of them. Aristotle's view is certainly the more intuitive. I'll say that. If Plato's thinking rationally, I don't think Aristotle's thinking the same. I also agree with Plato, <laughs> but it's, it's a little bit, it, it's counterintuitive at first, but we'll look at exactly what the difference is and, and, and why there's such a, such a stark difference between the two and what, ha what it has to do with ethics, especially. We'll look at that on Tuesday. Based on feeling a good 
would like live rather than emotional happiness, mm -hmm. would that then mean that one could like say, I am satisfied by my life. It was horrible and miserable, but it was good enough. Um, no, because it's not merely subjective. Right? Now, you could, have, uh, you could have lived a life in which you were uh, basically constantly suffering and experiencing sadness, and it still could be a happy life, depending. Right? If you lived well, if you, if you did things that were fulfilling but were very costly and difficult and painful and all of that, you can still reasonably look back upon it and say, no, I've actually lived a good life, as painful as it was. Even Aristotle will agree with that. He will say, yes, that, that is possible. But not if like, your, your life was a, just a series of, uh, a series of you know, glass bones and paper skin and, and having horrible suffering at the entire time and accomplishing nothing with it. Even if you were to say, well, given my circumstances, I did the best I could. Well, you didn't do that well, really, according to Aristotle. All right. So moving on from this controversy, because like I said, we'll talk about this more on Tuesday as well, because uh, it's, it's a hell of a controversy, and it's, it's one of those key differences between the two, uh, and it's a, it's a very important one. Um, but I want to look at how exactly we figure out what is the ultimate human good, if it does have something to do with happiness. But we have to figure out exactly what that means and exactly how that applies to our various ends. Okay. So McInerney asks, how do we figure out what is the characteristic human end? What is it that we must pursue in order to be happy? How is it that we must pursue things in order to be happy? What is, what is it to be human? Small caveat here that I will mention. Um, in this context, at least for now, I'm using human and person interchangeably. Um, there are reasons to distinguish those two that do not come up here. Right? So I'm using the terms interchangeably for the moment. Uh, that, that might come up at some point later, but for now, human, person, same thing. We're talking about human ends. Um, what it means to live humanly well is roughly the same thing as to be a good person. Okay. So because of that, um, I want to bring up one other term that he uses that uh, I don't expect you to have understood. But he uses it a lot and doesn't explain it, um, which is what he refers to as a qua locution. Does anyone know what that meant? Did anyone get that either from context or knowing what the hell he was talking about? No. no? He said like man qua man, which like yes, he did say that. He did say that. Yes, that's. Um, and that's also my question. I'm like, what does that mean? No, I think it was um, 17 ish. No. I think it's 20? Yeah. I will believe you. Yeah, it's around here. It's around here. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this area. It's around page 20 or so. Um, so th this, by the way, so here's, here's the annoying part. This, this term, qualocution, is a neologism that, that McInerney came up with. This is him. This is not a common term. It's not a term that exists. No one says this. Mm -hmm. Location? Nope. That, however, qua, is a common philosophical term to the point where I just read it and assume it's English, even though it's Latin, um, because it is a very, very commonly used term in philosophy to the point where if I hadn't taught this course a bunch of times, I would just be using it and expecting you to know what I'm, what I'm talking about because I know what it's talking about, right? This comes back to that point that I don't quite know what you don't know because some things that are plain language to me are bizarre and mystical to the rest of the world, this being one of them. So does anyone know what the term might mean, qua? Yeah. Close. Falling out? No, not quite. Wrong direction? Maybe? You're getting close. It's a sort of conjunctive part of speech. So, okay, so there is a simple one word translation for it, and then there's a lot of sort of baggage that comes with it, yeah? Is it like as? Yes. Oh. Okay. Yes. So qua, straightforwardly, just means as. That is how you would just translate it if you were translating a Latin text. 
But like I said, there's a lot of sort of context that comes with that. So in the context of uh, when he's talking about man qua man, or man qua artist, or qua fiddler, or qua fisher, what he's talking about is as Um, as um, describable in terms of, let's say. Or maybe we can say considered as. And a qualocution is basically just means describing something using the term qua. Right. So man qua fiddler means man considered in his capacity as playing the fiddle. Right. So you would say this this person is good qua fiddler. What that means is they're a, they're good at playing the fiddle. If we say this person is good qua human, what we mean is this is a good person. Okay, make sense? This all, again, this is one of those things where the terminology gets in the way, but once it clicks, hopefully this kind of will fit together. Okay, so just to sort of go through this, briefly, this, uh, this first paragraph here on page 20, the first complete paragraph. Um, the human good, man's chief good, is variously expressed as happiness, acting well, living well, or that for the sake of which, or the ultimate end. Right? These terms do not mean some particular good among others. This is back to the point we were making earlier. Thus, the human good cannot be the end of a particular action, of some one action distinct from all other human actions. <clears throat> The ultimate good, then, must be what makes the countless goods at which human actions aim human goods. So if we can head a bit, um, this is quoting Aristotle. This might perhaps be given if we could first ascertain the function of man. So the function of man, what is chiefly characteristic of the human being as an end or as a purpose. For just as for a flute player, a sculptor, or any artist, and in general, for all things that we have a function or activity, the good and the well is thought to reside in the function. So it would seem to be for man if he has a function. So, we know that the artist is good qua artist when he does art well. The flutist is good qua flutist when he plays the flute well. The person is good qua um, I don't know, dancer, when they dance well, gracefully, what have you. This bit of plastic is good qua cup when it holds liquid well. But it might also be bad qua kindling. If I were to light this on fire, it would not do particularly well at starting a fire. It is, I think, somewhat flame retardant. Not excessively, but not, not very much. If I put it in the fire, it would still burn, and it would produce lots of acrid smoke and stuff. But if I just like lit a match and held it under the thing, it might melt a bit. But yeah, it wouldn't produce flame well. Right? Now, a better example of this. <clears throat> We're in the wrong building for me to use this example. <laughs> when I teach in St. Edward's, I know this example works very well, because I will sometimes just drop a lit match on the floor um, to demonstrate that they very intentionally put fire retardant carpets in St. Edward's because it's the science building. Oh, Lewis. Lewis, yeah, not St. Edward's. This is St. Edward's. Yeah, Lewis. Whatever, the other one. The one over there. That one. They have fire retardant carpets in there for good reason, right? There's Bunsen burners and stuff all over the place, right? So it is, that is good qua carpet because it, you know, it cushions your steps and stuff. But it's also good qua fire retardant, bad qua kindling. This, by contrast, I don't know and I don't want to try. It's an older building, probably older carpet. Not designed with that purpose in mind, so it doesn't work qua that function. Okay. What about qua human being? Okay. To figure this out, <clears throat> we have to figure out what it is that humans uniquely and characteristically do. 
because that is what you have to figure out to figure out what the function of something is. What is the thing that it uniquely does? This is a hard question. Complex on its own existence. Yeah, yeah, kind of, maybe, partially. That's part of it. That has something to do with it. Humans in general. Yes, it sure does. A person, now, what you're saying, is, the point you're making is, a person in particular might have some particular function based on what they, what they do or what they've chosen to do, right? We'll see more of this when we read Plato next week as well, because he talks about the, the function, not of humans in general, but the function of some particular person within their social context and how that relates to their function overall, right? Because that does have something to do with ethics. Right? Me teaching well has something to do with me being good. Watch it. As I am a teacher, it is part of my identity, it is part of my function within society, and if I did this poorly, then, uh, let me put it this way. Um, this, again, Plato talks about this a lot more, but if I were particularly bad at this, if I were just a terrible teacher that could not hold your attention for more than a few seconds at a time, I hope I'm better than that, who knows. If that were the case, though, I would be making the wrong choice by continuing in this profession, say. Right. My, favorite, my favorite illustration of this is uh, pick your favorite um, uh, either hypothetical or real example of somebody who goes off to Hollywood in pursuit of, in pursuit of a, uh, a, a career there, who has no particular talent for acting or screenwriting or singing or whatever it happens to be, but they, but they got a dream and they pursue that dream until they grind themselves into the dust and have lived a terrible life in pursuit of this hopeless dream. Right. As a professor of mine once said when they were teaching this, uh, a happy broom is one that is sweeping, not one that wants to be Angelina Jolie. Anyway. So you got to figure out what it is that we do characteristically. So I, I have a I have a good uh, illustration of this. I think a good enough illustration of this. You've seen this, I think, right? No, maybe. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, th this is an illustration looking at aesthetics in particular, and looking at uh, looking at what characterizes certain kinds of things and certain kinds of things. So um, hopefully this will be somewhat helpful and illustrative. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> helpful, make sense, great. So, okay, first of all, in part, that was intended as something of a parody of, uh, of way to think PC video essays. Um, I, I decided to do this one, one evening, went completely manic and recorded and edited it until like 4 a.m. once, because I, I don't know. I, Wait, you made that? Yes, that was yes, that was my voice. Huh. Very close to the microphone, you couldn't tell? No, I thought that was really first. The microphone must it, to do a video essay well. Yes, I also did that. Yes. Um, my full name in fact. You also uh, to do a video essay well, you must be touching the microphone at all times. Huh. Anyway, um, I digress. The point being though is that I I actually do it does I think function as a kind of illustration of the kind of things that we've been talking about, of trying to figure out what something is, what is most characteristic of a particular kind of thing, such that we can figure out what is its ergon, its function, what makes it that kind of a thing, and so what is its characteristic end? Why are you shaking your head? Because you think rat is a bad example? No, or? because I remember a very similar conversation that went south during our class. Every conversation Did it involve sandwiches? It was sandwiches. Yeah, we'll get to that. Chairs. We'll get to that. Yeah, I'll come up eventually. We only have 10 minutes left, so we can't really talk about sandwiches. There isn't enough time. Um, we'll get to it eventually. Now, though, for now, let's look at this. Let's look at this sort of chain of being, of beings. So most simply and most fundamentally, we have beings. That is, things which exist. Given that that's its most fundamental characteristic of any given thing, being is, it, it, it continuing its existence is its most characteristic end because that's what it's characteristically capable of doing. That applies to anything. That applies to the table, the marker, the human, the tree, the rat, whatever. All of these things are capable of existing. And therefore, it's 
the good of any given thing at its most basic level is its continued existence. It is bad for the thing to not be. Right. Okay, simple enough. When the thing becomes more complicated, when you go from looking at a rock to looking at a tree, looking at the tree, the tree is now capable of more things than a rock. It is not just capable of continuing to exist, it is capable of taking in nutrients from its environment, of growing and then making more trees. Continuing its existence, so still doing this, in characteristically new ways. By taking in nutrients and growing, it can continue existing in a dynamic way. In producing offspring, it can continue its existence through its progeny. So it does this like this. And so when it does things in this way, that is now characteristic of the thing, of that particular kind of thing, and so it is a higher function of that thing. It is what, the, what is good for the thing is to do this well, which is to say to do this in this way. Make sense? With me so far? Okay, animals are a layer more complicated than plants. Now plants here, I would include like fungi and I would include most microbacteria, things like that, but Aristotle didn't quite have that distinction. All of this is entirely based on Aristotle, so we've got these categories. Animals, animate beings, in addition to existing, in addition to reproducing and taking in nutrients, they also take in information about their environment, they have sensation, and they move around their environment. They auto-locomote. They move themselves about, right? Okay, and because now they have these additional powers, these additional things they can do, they still do all this stuff, but they do it in new ways. So the rat will actually go and find food, whereas a tree takes in nutrition from the soil and from the sun, roughly speaking. Okay, so because now they have these new capacities for doing things, they still do everything else, but they do it in a characteristically new way. And so being capable of using these powers to achieve these other ends is what makes an animal a good animal, a good particular of that species. With me so far? Okay, what about us? What are human beings? What is characteristic of a human being? Two things we can say. What was that? We're not well, so are rats, though. Persons. Again, I'm using the terms interchangeably. Okay, so. I'll give it away. Rational animals. We're rational. Our reason is what sets us apart uniquely. You, you got it right beforehand, that our capacity for self-examination and rational, rational abstraction. We would also say we are innately political. In other words, we are social in a unique way. We have not just interrelationships with other members of our species, but we have things like communities. So our, the two things, the two powers that we have that set us apart are reason and community. Okay. So if we are set apart by our reason and our community, our capacity for rational abstraction to understand not just the particular thing, but the kind of thing overall, and our capacity to not just see other people, but to see other members of our community. We can see things like, we can see and understand things like the class, and not just the various individuals in the room. We're capable of conceptualizing each of, our, each of ourselves as members of a united whole. Even if that whole is not quite as real as the particular members, it is still a common abstraction that allows us to, uh, allows us to act together in certain ways in a way that, say, packs of animals don't. They interrelate to each other. I was going to ask that because, I mean, like, there's packs of animals that mm -hmm. understand community, and I, I would think they do, at least, because sort they, of. they keep themselves together. Yes, they do. They see, they see things like that, that creature in particular as being close to and related to me. Yeah. And that applies to each member of the community. But what, happen, what, what they don't have is a sense of the pack. As a, as a unit, right? They don't, animals don't, for example, exile each other. We do that. Now they might, they might kill each other. Um, they might kill each other. They might attack someone, attack another animal in their pack and they might be driven off. 
But they don't, but if that animal then comes back, it is just seen as you're no longer part of us, you're not related to us. It's different from you were part of this community and you are in exile. The concept of exile is a very human thing. Reason again applies in the same way that animals are not capable of doing this sort of thing because this sort of thing means abstracting away from the particulars to a universal concept. You'll notice that if you if you've ever moved with if you've ever like moved an animal's food bowl or gotten a new one and put it somewhere else, they have to be sort of retaught that this is where with this is where food is and this is what it looks like, because they can't abstract food bowl as a concept and apply it to this particular individual and that particular individual. Right? They don't have a concept of food bowl. They have, a, they have this thing and they have that thing. And they have to learn that this thing functions in some certain way that means it feeds me. That one used to, but it's gone now. This is, this is for instance, why if you move a cat's litter box for a while, they'll keep pooping in the same spot. It's really annoying. Um, don't ever put your cat's litter box in your closet. Bad experience. Anyway, point being that we do all of these things in this way. We eat right, in the very same way that animals do. We take in nutrition in this way, but not in exactly the same way. How do we eat differently from animals? We have a purchaser. Okay, we... we both of those things are interesting, right? Because that relies on both reason and community. We purchase food from each other, right? We rely on one another in our sort of, our sort of networks of community in a way that's very different from we just happen to work together on killing this thing and I'm gonna have my piece and you're gonna have some piece and that sort of thing. It's, it's a kind of structured interreliance in a, both a rational way and a communal political way. Political, again, not in the legislative sense, but in the community sense. And we also make food. By make, we don't mean just like poof into existence. We, we take ingredients and we craft meals. We make the food that we make more nutritious. Again, applying reason to the creation of things. We make it more, uh, more appetizing. We do things to make it taste better. And by cooking food, we do this really interesting thing. Because the, the human digestive system isn't capable of digesting a whole bunch of stuff that we eat anyway. But we do things to the food to make it in such a way that we can digest it. We expand our menu, so to speak, beyond our natural nutritive capacities, using our reason. We also do this other thing called meals. Yeah. Are we also like, using like a silver and like plates? Yeah. Foods? Yeah, yeah. We use tools, certainly. But then we also, we also have meals. We have times where we eat things. We have gatherings of people where we eat things. For instance, it would be rude and not quite fully human to go to eat with someone, go out to eat with, for lunch with friends, and not eat. Right? To just go ahead and eat before you go out with everybody and just say, oh, no thanks, I'll just have water. It's, it's rude. It's, it's, it's a, a kind of a... a um, a, a disruption of that society or social order that you're otherwise forming. And it's because we, we do this in this way. So that is to say, this, doing this and applying our reason and our community to all of the various other things we do is something very close to or something like our ultimate end. There we go. There's an answer. We'll expand on this some more later. Applying reason to all of what we do doing things in our distinctively human and rational way.